So we will be talking today about decision making and uh, in particular uh, two techniques, decision trees and state machines. Uh, these are simple techniques. So here you have an agenda decision trees. Turing machine, I will not look into very much detail on it, but because it's uh, it lies in the fundamental basis of this um, uh, of the theory of state machines. I will very briefly talk about Turing machine. Uh, we are not going to use Turing machine uh, directly. And we also have spiders attack a workshop activity. Uh, so first of all, uh, this is the diagram that if you watched or participated in my lecture last week, you should be familiar with. And if you haven't, uh, just watch now. This is the generic model of artificial intelligence model of AI. Uh, so the central part of any kind of AI structure must be decision making because it's all about the system that does some kind of uh, decision making. So we have decision making in the heart of any AI. Deci decision making will be connected to movement of the non-player character NPC uh, because movement is actually the only way in which uh, uh, NPC can interact with its world. Uh, and these two things together, decision making and movement, which is a, actually, you know, a combination of uh, decisions about movement and actual movement, uh, this creates the character AI. Then we also have a strategy and we will not be talking too much about strategy games because you know, I had to choose the scope for this for for this lecture, but this is something that can affect uh, the character AI. So this would be a group strategy of groups of AI. And then we have the world, the world interface that can affect characters and groups. And we also have output, how the output can be done to express the movement, express whatever decision the character is making, you will need two of these two things, animation just to express, to communicate what's going on to the player, but also physics. Physics is in the way, the, the way in which uh, the character normally interacts with the world. So the character does something and the world uh, replies, responds or reacts to the, the, your action through the world physics, for this physics simulation. So actually very nicely physics, what we discussed in my module last year, um, integrates very closely with uh, game AI, but I think it's 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 good. And there are two other aspects that we are not particularly interested in today, content creation and scripting. Uh, the important thing is that today we are talking first of all about decision making. So how these decisions can be made by the character. Um, another diagram, another diagram, decision making will be influenced by internal and external knowledge. Internal knowledge is what the character knows about itself and what it knows about itself who will characterize today quickly as the character state. OK, so uh, when particularly when we come to state machines, the character will be in different states like uh, idle mode or patrol state or attack or flee, whatever. Uh, the first thing to make a decision what to do next has to be what am I doing now and what state I am. And the, the, the other source of the uh, knowledge is external knowledge. So reading the world, observing, sensing the world. Uh, today, our decision making will be done. Oh, yeah, on the both both uh, both bases, internal and external uh, knowledge, and you will very soon see uh, how it happens. Then after the decision is made, an action is requested or performed. And again, this action can change the uh, internal knowledge, first of all, by switching the state. So if the action, for example, is run away, it can change uh, the internal state from attack to flee. OK, and uh, in, the, in these terms, uh, an action taken at some moment 
can affect future actions by this changing of internal state. And of course, the action will also change the external world. Uh, so external changes can affect the future external knowledge. For example, if the character is attacking the player, it can decrease the health of the player and uh, the health, the decreased health of the player can change the future way of uh, behaving of future decision made by the character. So this is a very dynamic process and it may look, may look, uh, you know, complicated. But these two the techniques that we are going to talk about today, the decision trees and state machines, are both created and proposed in order to make all this process of making decisions and then interacting with the uh, outcomes of these decisions and using the internal and external knowledge uh, reasonably easy to cope with. OK, so what are the decision trees? Uh, you have an example of a decision tree here. I assume everyone is familiar with the uh, generic generic uh, uh, approach to this to this method. If not, please interrupt me. I can explain in more details, but I think that this single example shows you what it is about. Uh, so, what we can tell about the session trees, this is definitely the simplest way of knowledge representation and it's indeed a kind of knowledge representation because there is knowledge representation in it. Okay, the previous slide gave you a big chunk of knowledge which would say, I am a cat. Okay, and all this catness was included in this simple tree. Uh, it's basic mapping between input and output, but uh, decision trees can still be quite complex. Um, uh, what we have here are connected decision points and the actions are the tree leaves. So what we uh, can get is a tree. Uh, the decisions are connected in between, so we have these connections here. And each leaf or the end of the branch in the decision tree will be an action. All right. So here we have uh, a simple decision tree um, consisting of four, four decisions, four actions. Actually, this is also action, but this is how we quite often uh, show in decision trees in visual representation of visual of decision tree um, that the uh, action should be idle, just do nothing. Okay. Uh, so in this case, if there is no visible or audible enemy, do nothing. The, the, just don't care, don't change anything in your state. Uh, but in some other cases, so if there is a uh, uh, enemy that you can hear but not see, you should creep. Okay. If there is an uh, visible enemy and close enough, you will attack. If it is a visible enemy but not so close, then you also check the position of this uh, uh, of this enemy. If it's on your flank then move to a better position. If it's not on flank, attack frontally. All right, you can notice that uh, most of the knowledge here, and this is the weak point of decision trees, but there is uh, no actual different representation between internal and external knowledge. In this decision tree, we have uh, all the questions, all the decisions are made on the basis of the external knowledge. Can I see the enemy? Can I hear the enemy? How far is the enemy? Where is this enemy? Uh, but of course, a decision tree can be also based on the internal knowledge. For example, we could easily add a decision here based on um, the level of internal health or even I think that I did uh, previously. So here you have a um, sample action made on the basis of three decisions made. Uh, visible enemy, uh, farther than 10 meters away, and on your flank. So we will be moving to a better position. 
So I think that conceptually decision trees are pretty much uh, easy. A little bit of technicalities. Decisions are simple and the decisions may be typ typically may be done on the basis of uh, different data types. So in case of uh, any representation that is in a bool data type, the decision is simple. It's just true or false. Uh, if you have enumerations, which is quite often the case uh, with uh, states, internal states, um, your agent or any other any other agent in the scene can be um, states are quite often represented as enumeration, and then you can just match if your if the state of the enemy is uh, fleeing then chase him if uh, the enemy uh, the, the enemy state is uh, attack then defend this kind of stuff uh, also quite often uh, the decision will be based on an integer float uh, value uh, then you probably would change uh, the range of this it can be a vector and you can check if the vector length or magnitude is within a given range. So all possible combinations uh, um, are here. All right, decision trees can be uh, translated into conditionals in any programming language. So uh, an example of decision trees here, if A and B, please note that uh, to get to one, you have to get both A and B condition true. OK, so it's if A and B, then operation one or action one. In any other case, action two. All right, so you would need a little bit of basis in uh, uh, logical programming to create these, uh, these structures. Two observations here. First of all, uh, we did similar stuff uh, last year. So unless we have students here who uh, followed a different path and uh, didn't have game science module, most of you should be familiar with this kind of stuff. And the second observation here is, uh, well, simple decision trees like this or this one um, are not particularly complicated, but uh, in real world scenarios, decision trees sometimes are really tricky, really complex, and uh, sometimes you really need uh, a thorough testing of your solution to ensure that all possible combinations of conditions are proce processed properly. So, Decision trees can become complicated and have to be thoroughly tested. Uh, here is um, uh, another another example of something that may happen to a tree. Uh, in the upper picture, you have the unbalanced tree. What is an unbalanced tree? If you imagine how uh, the game would go through this decision tree, it would be check this uh, this uh, decision point. Perhaps do A, but perhaps not. So go ahead to B, to, to this decision. Uh, imagine how many operations you have to do in a quite likely case that your action to do is H. You have to do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven decisions. Uh, so in case of uh, game performance, uh, particularly if these decisions might be, you know, if, if these are not a simple variable test, but something more complicated uh, than using a more balanced tree like this, in which every decision can be uh, can be approached for maximum three. Sorry, not every decision. Every action can be initiated after maximum three decisions made. Please balance trees to improve performance. It's not a very important thing because balance, uh, trees are anyway quite light structures and uh, quite fast, but if you have a problem with performance, even sometimes unbalanced trees may be the reason. Um, in case of trees, it's not like uh, like you might think that it is just a, a binary kind of a tree with a um, decision node and two possible actions. All right, if you were taught about uh, flow charts, 
Some people have some restrict, quite restrictive ideas about flowcharts. In decision trees are not that restrictive. So first of all, you can have multi-branching trees, no, a pro, no, not a problem. And uh, uh, quite funnily, you can have merging branches, all right? So uh, two different paths may uh, lead to the same position in the uh, decision tree. Uh, another situation that doesn't make any problem with creating decision trees. Um, there are also situations in which uh, the decision tree will be not determined by uh, all the facts, not necessarily and entirely determined. Uh, it may happen that a decision tree is based on some kind of a, a random thing. So uh, here under attack, if yes, then defend. If no, flip a coin, so make a random decision and either patrol or stand still. Okay, here I used a metaphor of uh, flipping a coin. Uh, in uh, real life scenarios, quite often it would be several different paths and it may happen that, for example, path number one is chosen with uh, probability 0.1. Path number two with probability 0 0.3, and path number three is chosen with probability 0, uh, 0 0.6. Uh, changing probabilities and actually adding some kind of randomness into your AI machine is uh, a very good idea. Uh, you may remember from the last lecture when I told you uh, about the uh, early reviews of Pac-Man game. Uh, and uh, these uh, early reviews uh, were from people who believed that Pac-Man is actually high AI, advanced AI game. And this was just some randomness in, uh, in the behavior of uh, uh, the ghosts in, in Pac-Man and some uh, differences between the probabilities le probability levels uh, those, those uh, those um, uh, decisions were taken with. One more uh, aspect of uh, decision tricks, trees, uh, strictly technical, they can be either hard coded or uh, object oriented. So hard coded are quite trivial, okay? This is a set of if instruction. Uh, quite simple, and you will just code them in C++ or your other programming language. If something happens, then do this action, else do another action. Two things about it. Uh, they are probably the best solution if your tree is small and simple, but may get complex if your tree is large and complicated and actually a nightmare to maintain if it is really, really large. So if you have a large and complicated uh, tree, you may want to go to the object-oriented solution, which is still reasonably simple, but it is first of all configurable, flexible, easy to maintain, and even scriptable, so you can read this uh, the structure of this um, uh, decision tree from an external file, and this makes uh, a, any changes to the behavior of your game agents quite easy to, to maintain, to, to introduce, to perform, to control. Uh, all right, and even you can uh, allow your players to generate mods for your game, write scripts for your character. So it may be quite a powerful thing if you have a well-written, object-oriented, scriptable decision tree system. And uh, the next few slides show a little bit of programming in C++ implementation of a very simple class that can be used to create date, uh, decision tree in object-oriented situation. Uh, it's not scriptable, but it is a situation in which you can you can uh, easily, reasonably easily, uh, create your uh, tree from the program, and then execute it. And if you would like to uh, use this approach, or at least test it and look how it is done, um, there is a 
test application uh, here in your AI project. It's called decision tree. Okay, it's a very simple text based uh, text based project uh, which asks a few decisions from the keyboard and uh, makes the proper uh, decision about them. So I will now download this project. And let's have a quick look at this project, how it ra runs. It's uh, exceptional. It's not a GFC project, so you don't need even GFC to run it. You just need Visual Studio. OK, so. All right, and it's really simple. Can you see any enemies? Can we see enemies or not? No. Um, no, thank you. No. Uh, is your health OK? Anyone? Yes. I don't, yes. Seek out enemies. OK, very simple thing. So. Uh, can you see enemies? Yes. No. Uh, no, let's say no. OK, uh, no uh, as previously, but now uh, the health will be as well. No. OK, seek out health packs. Uh, quite logical, isn't it? All right, so it's very simple, terribly simple. Can you see enemies? Yes. Is the enemy close by? Yes or no, guys? No. No. So enemies, but not. Is your health OK? No. No, run away. This simple application that you can download and test, it's really not, nearly nothing, but it shows some kind of a uh, decision creation and it's made out of these uh, building blocks uh, in object oriented C coding. Uh, so we have a, a generic class of nodes. Nodes can be then, as you can see, uh, either decision nodes or action nodes. So if this is a generic node and it has a virtual function make decision, virtual, pure virtual function, so without any implementation. And then we have two concrete uh, uh, classes. One is uh, the decision uh, node. The decision nodes node will have two branches, yes or no. And because these branches, yes or no, they are both this, uh, defined as generic nodes. Uh, these uh, uh, branches, yes or no, may be either to other decisions or to actions. Okay, we still have a virtual function get branch that has to be implemented to create the real decision, and this real decision will uh, say either yes or no. So this is the uh, logic for this node. And then we have the make decision function, which will ask the get branch the logic. OK, and on this basis, it will either take branch yes or no. And if we have any branch, it will uh, recursively ask the next branch, so either yes or no to make another decision. OK, or it will return null if there is no decision or no branch. Uh, null actually shouldn't happen, but uh, but it is just a safeguard so that the program doesn't uh, doesn't crash if there is no next uh, decision to do. And this is how the action is done. So in case of action, the make decision function is just returning itself. All right. So action says, OK, don't do anything else. That's the decision. That's the final thing that you are uh, supposed to do. And the action also have the act uh, method. The act would be actually uh, doing something something useful. And the actual implementation is this is how we get the branch in this particular very simple program that I demonstrated. So getting a branch is just displaying a question, getting an answer from uh, from the uh, user and checking checking if it was yes or anything else. Anything else means no. So get branch making the decision was just asking the uh, player 
and the acting was just displaying the action test, just displaying the message on the screen. So terribly simple thing. Uh, but what's important is uh, this is how this um, decision tree can be created out of decision and action nodes. OK, so uh, there is a decision here with the question, can you see enemies? And branch yes is decision number two, branch no is decision number one. Decision number one, so branch no after can you see enemies is another decision to be made. Is your health OK? And then you either go to action zero or action one. I hope you you, you know what uh, what it is, uh, what's going on here. And if not, I would send you out to the uh, sample program I demonstrated. As I told you, it doesn't make too much thing, uh, but decision trees can be complex and can be quite useful. Uh, can be quite quite useful. This is an example of the decision tree. I think that's the decision tree that is implemented in this uh, simple program. So actually with uh, seven different decisions and five different actions, uh, it's still on the side that I would say it's reasonably simple to hard code in the program. All right, one more popular uh, decision tree, which is quite popular in the Internet. I will leave you with it for a minute uh, to. Just see uh, what it is. This is the generic decision tree for any kind of mechanic work you would ever need to complete. Um, what what is um WD forty? Stops squeaks, drives out moisture, cleans and protects, loosens rusted parts, frees sticky mechanisms. Uh, the take home message about decision trees, it's um, elementary, but elementary things are trivial and very useful at the same time. All right, so there is not much theory behind it. Uh, if you think it's so trivial that uh, actually no reason to talk about it because you can uh, create uh, sculpt decision trees by uh, using several ifs in your program, and you do it on an everyday basis, uh, creating your games. Yes, you are doing decision trees on everyday basis. On the other hand, if the decision tree looks like this, it becomes, starts to become uh, complex and it may uh, require the proper approach and thinking about it and first of all testing it. Anyway, that's uh, that's the absolutely simplest thing in AI. And uh, the second thing, the second AI tool that we will discuss today, the second and final, are state machines. OK, so again, state machine, um, this illustration should tell you a lot about state machines. Um, so uh, this node means uh, the beginning, the starting point of the state machine. And we automatically go from the start to on guard state. This is the state, all right? The agent can be in three different states. By default, it's on guard, so it's guarding the some space, all right? If you see a small enemy, you go to the fight state. If you are noticing that you uh, are losing this fight, you sorry, you run away. OK, and when you are escaped from the fight. Uh, you go back to the on guard state, and if you see big, big enemy, not a small enemy, but big enemy, you go straight to the runaway state. So I think you also have idea, some idea how uh, these state machines work. And now a little bit of history. Uh, so perhaps not the most essential stuff for you to know, but also um, something that is so much important for the theoretical 
uh, fundamentals of computer science that I feel that we really should spend a little bit of time talking about Alan Turing, the British mathematician, cryptanalyst and uh, computer scientist, um, called father of computer science, uh, the first person to give a formalization of such terms like uh, algorithm and computation. Uh, but uh, one of the most important things he created, it's a, uh, first of all, even if it is called a Turing machine, it's not a real machine, it's a theoretical concept, okay? Uh, practical implementation is possible, but would be completely impractical, so don't try this at home. Uh, but it provides a formal model of computation and can simulate the logic of any algorithm. I wouldn't like to stop too long for on, on the Turing machine, uh, but uh, the concept is that you have a tape, and you can see this tape here, there are some symbols written on the tape, and you also have a head that can do uh, three actions, move left, move right, or do nothing. And this uh, uh, this um, this uh, head can also be in any of uh, a number of states. So here you have a tape with a binary number one one zero zero one zero one one, and the head currently in the state Q zero. And we can create a program for Turing machines, so what was important, it was in uh, the 40s, and Turing created a theoretical concept of a machine that was programmable, all right? So before actually creating the first uh, computer. Uh, the Turing machine can be programmed by providing a special table, uh, which provides the following information. In any state, and the head can be in three states, Q0, Q1, or Q2, on seeing a symbol on the tape, and the symbol can be 0, 1, or none, uh, this table tells you two things. First of all, the new state that you should, actually three things, the new state that you should uh, go to, it can possibly also show, tell you what new symbol you should print into the tape, and what should you do, either go left, or right, or neither. OK, so uh, let's have a quick analysis of this situation. State Q0 represents searching for the number and what it says. If you are in the state Q0 and you see nothing in the tape, you should go left. So the head would go left here. And of course, here the situation would happen again, then you would go left one more uh, one more uh, step, and eventually you would arrive to the symbol one. If you have the symbol, the symbol one in the search for the number Q0 state, you will write zero at this place and switch to the state Q1. Q1 is invert the bit, all right? And I will not continue this. Anyone who is uh, uh, who would like to know how the Turing machine works, it's a question of a simple, a simple, uh, simple simulation. And I will add a separate uh, video material about Turing machines, which will be optional because uh, it's not a strict requirement for this module for you to understand how Turing machine works. But if you want to do uh, that, there will be an extra short video material based on this particular slide. Uh, here is another sequence, uh, another program uh, please note that these programs can become quite complicated at some moment, by ba but basically it says if you are, for example, in state Q2 and you can see the asterisk or star on the tape, go to or remain in state Q2, go left. Or if you can spot zero, go to state Q3. If you can spot one, Right, a uh, star, go to state Q0, move right, and so on, so on, so on. So um, uh, these programs can become quite complicated, and at some moment, uh, Turing 
who proposed this tabular uh, form noticed one thing. Actually, the table is quite logical, easy to read, but to really understand what's going on, you can represent this table um, visually. Okay, so each circle here represents a state. And each connection tells you, first of all, to which another state you should go. It's labeled here in the beginning with the uh, symbol. So, for example, you will uh, switch from Q0 to Q1 if you read 0 on the tape. And this gives you some additional action. This additional action is put in a, a star, write the star on the tape and move left. All right, so um, the reason why, why I'm showing this is only to show you that state graph is actually one of the most fundamental concepts in the whole of computer science, and it was uh, introduced by Alan Turing like 60 or 70 years ago, very, very long time ago, right? And it's a one to one uh, interpretation of uh, is the Turing machine program. And this means that actually you can represent any algorithm, any algorithm as a state machine or state machine graph in that form as it is shown here. OK, uh, and uh, uh, we have mathematical evidence showing that every algorithm that we know can be transformed into the Turing machine program and therefore can be transformed into a state graph. We'll not represent every possible algorithm as a state graph, uh, but uh, we will concentrate on uh, something that is uh, mathematically called finite state machine. There is also an infinite state machine in which the number of states is infinite, but it would be not very practical for game development. So we uh, keep the finite state machine with finite number of states. And uh, the time arrived to introduce uh, the workshop activity. The workshop activity is called Spider's Attack. I put these programs on box because it's probably the fastest way for you to grab these programs now. Um, Later on, I will tend to switch to GitLab, but in this initial stage of the module, let's just use Box. And uh, this is how the program looks like. You have a boy, and uh, I have programmed the boy for you, so it actually has its own simple uh, state machine. You can uh, browse through the state machine in the code. But we also have three different spiders here that should do something, that should eventually be uh, artificial agents, AI agents. Uh, now they are doing nothing because uh, they are not programmed properly. And your task will be to make them behave, all right? So uh, first of all, attack the boy. The boy can attack, so you can see uh, I have attacked, attacked the spider. Um, uh, I'm not sure if you spotted, probably you spotted. I, I will do this to another spider now. When I'm attacking the spider, when I'm attacking the spider, the spider's health drops to zero but the spider doesn't even know how to die, okay? So I cannot kill them. I can just decrease the health. All right, so uh, I will also show you the finished version of the same game, Spider Attack Complete in my um, secret project hidden folder. Uh, this is how the game is supposed to look like when completed. And more or less, I will be expecting you to complete this game to this stage uh, within a week. So you can notice that the spiders are now alive. 
Okay, and uh, when I come too close to any spider, it starts chasing me. And attacking me, and now I will, okay, I attacked this one. Oh, I'm nearly dead. Oh, I'm probably too weak to attack. I think you you have the idea, so if you come too closely to any spider, it will follow you. And eventually attack and kill. OK, so I got killed by one of them. Uh, so this is what you are supposed to. To do. This is uh, the uh, state diagram for the spider, and this is the uh, labeled uh, state diagram. So the spider starts in idle, but if its health is is good, if uh, the health is uh, greater than ninety, and uh, usually in the being of the game it will, it will go directly to patrolling. Then, if it is the, the if it happens that the health is uh, less than twenty, it will go back from patrolling to idle. Uh, if in the patrolling state the enemy distance is less than two two hundred, it will chase. But if the health of the spider is less than thirty, it will switch to fleeing. And if the health is even lower, it will be. It will go back to idle. If the health is less than one, it will die, and so on. Okay. Uh, here, uh, in the idle, if enemy distance is less than fifty, you go to attack, and from attack you can also die. All right. So this is this is how the spider is supposed to uh, work. Here is a, a set of uh, transitions and conditions. So this is basically the same thing as here, but re the representation is closer to Alan Turing's tables uh, for uh, the machine's programs. So uh, it gives you, for example, information that you should chase. Sorry, that if your current state is chase and the enemy distance is less than 50, you should transition to attack. Uh, so, spider attack is your workshop exercise, and please note that the boy, the player sprite, is fully working. You can try it, you can analyze it code. It contains already a simple FSM. FSM stands for finite state machine, uh, so you can check how uh, the boy is implemented uh, before you start uh, implementation of the, uh, of, the, of the FSM for the spiders. Uh, your task is to finish implementation of the spider and in particular state changes, state dependent actions, so the actions that the spider does depending on the state and all the transitions, so uh, going from one state to another state. Uh, state changes, there is implementation of the function change state, existing code implements animation switching, and you need to add something a little bit more uh, but I left you placeholders and some additional instructions in the code uh, so that to save all the stocking now, please just go to the code and analyze the code, try to uh, try to resolve the, 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 the task. Uh, one thing, uh, guys, if you are stuck with anything, if you have any questions, uh, if you need to get any advice from me, just use Discord to ask me any questions. State dependent actions. Uh, there is a number of uh, state dependent actions that I would like you to complete. These are additional actions that needed need to be added to the on update function. Uh, for example, in the idle state, you should increase health by 0.2. So that uh, spider who is in the idle mode would observe his health uh, slowly increasing. Uh, 
uh, in patrol mode, you should decrease your health so that uh, after some time of patrolling, the spiders will be uh, just tired and will have to stop. Take a random turn at a random frame. I think it's a step by step instruction here. So I, after a year of experience with game science, you should uh, know what what is uh, for you to do in it. Uh, but again, if you don't know how to start, if you are stuck, uh, drop in, in me a post in uh, Discord. Observe the discussion in Discord. One important thing uh, in Discord, please use the public channel we have there. The 3D graphics and AI channel um, rather than asking me private questions. All right, and the first thing that you will have to complete are transitions. Transitions should be implemented in the on update function, but you also have a placeholder there and even something is uh, already started. So transition is depending on the state. For example, if your state is idle and if health is greater than 90, change state to patrol. And the list of all these uh, state changes I already showed you, but it is once again in here. All right, so this is, this is what you uh, need uh, to do. Okay, so. Let's go back to the finite state machine lecture. State machines uh, implementation. Again, uh, we can consider two different uh, uh, implementation of uh, uh, finite state machines, and it may be either hard coded or object oriented. Hard coded is not as trivial as in as it was in case of decision trees, uh, but still simple enough. Okay, so so you can go this way, may get complex, and uh, again they will be a nightmare to maintain if they become really large. Uh, but I strongly recommend object-oriented approach here. Uh, still reasonably simple. Uh, still configurable and flexible and easy to maintain. They can be also easy to get scriptable. And uh, what is uh, a brilliant example of a state machine solution is um, a system called Mechanim available in Unity. I will not get here into competences of Darrell, so I will not show you this in Unity more than just a, a slide or two. But basically, that's uh, what uh, Unity can implement for you. So uh, this is basically a, a state graph in Unity Mechanism. Uh, you can see a number, a set of, of states. This is actually uh, the representation of our spider okay so you can visually build a graph like this and uh, then define transitions and uh, uh, various uh, conditions for this for these transitions so with uh, unity creating a uh, state machines uh, becomes um, a very pleasant i will not tell you that easy thing to do but quite a pleasant thing to do Uh, you can also create uh, uh, or define uh, quite detailed at a quite detailed level uh, how actions should uh, behave on the transition. Uh, so you can gradually uh, switch off one uh, action and get another action. Uh, because this uh, mechan Unity Mechanism system is very, very closely connected to the animation system. So this is actually the system behind the complex uh, animations in Unity. Uh, whether it is Unity or GFC, in GFC I have created uh, uh, some kind of a object-oriented structure for you, which you should find reasonably simple reasonably uh, useful to create your own uh, state machines. Um, the reason why I require you to use GFC for this particular uh, exercise is first of all, because I want you to be able to 
create state graphs, whatever environment you are working with, right? So why we are not using Unity here? The answer is simple. Unity just makes things too easy, right? You draw a graph, but you don't um, realize how a real coding level representation of the stuff would look like. So a little bit about the implementation. Uh, you need you do normally need three different classes: state, transition, and condition. State must contain a collection of possible transitions plus entry, update, and exit actions. So what you should do on the entry to the state, what you should do all the time in this in the state, and what you should do when you leave the state. A transition must have a condition. Um, to check, okay, however, you should create the transition to the next step uh, state or not. And also the target state, so where to go to which state should be the next step, uh, state. Uh, and the conditions in the object oriented approach to state machines, conditions may actually be decision trees. So you see that how uh, neatly the two techniques discussed today can uh, integrate to each other, all right? So you can have, you can create a state machine. The state machi machine has to make a decision whether to uh, make a transition to another state or not. And this decision may be based on a decision tree. So decision tree can be just a apparatus or something, a tool which you, uh, provide for the uh, state machine or state graph uh, in order to work properly. And a, a few more details about uh, some varieties of FSM of finite state machine. Uh, one thing that I would like to uh, just tell you that there is something like this and you may find it useful in some cases. Uh, this is a very simple, um, not yet hierarchical uh, state graph for a simple robot inspired by Wally. -E. Uh, so Wally -E is searching for flash, trash, and this is its uh, default action. Uh, when uh, Wally -E can see a piece of trash, then he should hard for trash, and when it got gets this trash, then hard for compactor to compact this this trash, and when it is disposed, go back to the search state. So very simple, three states, three transitions, nothing particularly complicated. But that's a robot, okay? Uh, and uh, Wally -E is an electric device and has to be charged from time to time. Therefore, we have additional transitions to the get power state. Please note that we actually need three different states here because Wally -E needs to know where to, what to do next. Okay, if it happened that. Uh, uh, he got no power whilst heading for trash. You know, his plan was quite big. So heading for trash or going for compact or could take a lot of time. And there was a possibility of no power on the journey to head for trash. Uh, so when it gets power and gets recharged, uh, he sh has to know that he should continue heading for trash. Okay, so we have three additional uh, states get power, three additional no power type of transitions, and three additional recharged types of transitions. And we can uh, simplify this graph by doing something like this. This is a graph called cleanup. And now we just tell if in any moment within this graph there is no power, go to get power state. And when you are recharged, go back to the same position within the main graph. This is how hierarchical uh, FSM uh, may look like. And we can also add another transition here. This is also possible, uh, all tricks allowed. Uh, 
from some particular, so not from any, but from a particular uh, state on a node rush found just a, a standard procedure when you don't see any trash go and get some power just in case. All right, so this is also uh, possible. OK. Oh, this image reminds me that that's the end of the lecture for today.